In an era shaped by the balance of power rather than the principles of justice and equality, the plight of Palestine stands as a stark reminder of the failures of the global system as the West's rules-based order clashes with international law. While Israel's powerful allies remain conspicuously silent, who will hold it to account? It's really a worrying that it's only countries of the South. The real test will be, will the most powerful join or do more? South Africa's foreign minister, Naledi Pandor, tells us why her country could not stand idly by. Hello, I'm Rida Fakhri. Welcome to Bigger Than Five. In today's world, the traditional influence of the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council is being questioned, and the Western-dominated international system is being challenged by new emerging forces from the global south. From our new vantage point here in London, we look at how the global order is being reshaped. Israel's relentless war on Gaza has exposed the glaring inequalities and biases in the international system. Supported by the United States and many Western governments, Israel's military offensive in Gaza has continued despite an order by the International Court of Justice to end all plausible acts of genocide. The case against Israel at the ICJ was brought by South Africa under the 1948 Genocide Convention. South Africa, a victim of the colonial apartheid system, has long stood in solidarity with the Palestinian people in their struggle against occupation and oppression. In 1997, President Nelson Mandela said, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of Palestinians. Today, despite the economic and political risks, South Africa is seeking justice for the tens of thousands of Palestinian victims of Israel's war on Gaza. My interview with South Africa's foreign minister in just a moment, but first, how the rules-based international order has become a catchphrase used by Western countries to control and influence, and the growing chorus of voices opposing it. We need all continents to rise up in defense for the rules-based order. In a world where international rules-based order matters, we must defend and reform the rules-based international order. We intend first and foremost to reaffirm the rules-based international order. We wrote these rules. We should follow them. The rules were never published, were never even announced by anyone to anyone. Apoyan tirar bombas sobre la gente porque están haciendo una demostración sobre la humanidad toda. Why this hypocrisy? Why the selective and ambivalent attitude? This cannot go on indefinitely, nor will it go unchallenged. Today's global order is not working for everyone. In fact, it's not working for anyone. The scale of the devastation inflicted on Gaza and the failure of the United Nations to act has renewed calls for action outside the UN Security Council, where the US has repeatedly used its veto to shield Israel from accountability. Now, while some Western governments stand accused of complicity, developing nations have become the world's moral compass. One of the loudest voices for justice is South Africa. I recently sat down with the country's foreign minister, Naledi Pandor. South Africa has managed to do what very few countries have ever dared to, which is take on Israel and its powerful Western allies. Will the existing international order, do you believe, deliver justice eventually for Palestinians? I hope uh, that the ICJ uh, decisions will help to deliver justice. I don't think uh, there'll be an entirely uh, positive response, as we've seen, uh, from the uh, government of Israel because we do believe there's a deadly intent uh, of genocide toward uh, the people of Palestine. And uh, given that intention and the massive uh, arms support uh, that Israel enjoys from parts of the international community, I think they believe that they can thumb their nose at everybody uh, and do as they wish. And it has been 
you know, so many decades of abuse without the world really responding in a positive manner to draw the two countries together uh, toward a settlement. So um, while I believe the ICJ has made a very, very important set of decisions and affirmed our belief uh, that it is plausible uh, that a process of genocide is underway, uh, the response thus far from the uh, Israeli government doesn't suggest a serious uh, appreciation and acknowledgement of international law. You have taken on powerful forces. Do you believe, given what you've just said, that it is ultimately a losing battle? I would not want to put myself in such a pessimistic position. I believe that it is vital that we have international institutions that protect the most marginalized and vulnerable. And I think it's our duty to ensure that they work. This is why we went to the highest court to put the convention uh, and its applicability uh, to the test. And the court has affirmed uh, the convention and its importance. And it is really up to uh, countries that have a great deal of influence and power over Israel to persuade uh, the government of Israel to finally act in accordance with all uh, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and to respect multilateral institutions. In its interim ruling on the 26th of January, in fact, the ICJ ordered Israel to stop any genocidal acts. Yet we've seen quite the opposite. There's been an uptick in violence against Palestinians. And as you say, uh, powerful countries that keep arming Israel are still shielding it from any accountability. Uh, this is the real pain, I think. How do you change this uh, dynamic? Because, um, you know, when you have countries that have the power to create peace and stability in the world, uh, when it is them uh, that essentially are fueling it, uh, what hope do smaller countries have? We believe that we must continue to use institutions such as the United Nations. We must continue to push Security Council members toward binding resolutions. By the way, the ICJ in its orders indicated to Israel that its decision on provisional measures are legally binding. In terms of the convention, they don't need an affirmation of the Security Council, with only five countries with a veto, which they use not in the interest of peace and security, but primarily in terms of their partisan uh, political positions. Do you believe the United States and other Western countries are obstructing international justice? Are you willing to take on the US and the UK? And other countries. Well, I think I'm, my country is far too small to take on. Is it a step too uh, far? The United States and other countries, they're major trading partners for South Africa. But I think in acknowledging that we shouldn't be dishonest on questions of peace and security and on questions of the authority of international law, because it is these very old democracies, established democracies, that often lecture us about human rights and about human rights being universal and applying to all. Our concern has always been that while these statements are made in practice, it would appear that human rights are seen as being there for some and not for the weakest. We're asserting if it is universal, let it be universal. Will we see more developing countries in Africa, in Latin America, if not in the Arab world, and I wonder what you make of the silence and inaction of Arab governments, will we see more countries take on potentially countries that are funding Israel's illegal occupation and war on Gaza? I, I do expect uh, that more countries of the South will, uh, but I think it's really uh, worrying that it's only countries of the South. The real test will be, will the most powerful join or do more uh, you know, the actions don't necessarily only need to be uh, the ICJ. We've also made a referral to the ICC. Uh, there have been terrible killings, the most recent 
uh, with uh, uh, Palestinians trying to get aid from a truck uh, and being fired at with live uh, ammunition as they sought food because of starvation, forced starvation. Now you would think if something like that were to happen to any nation, any people, the whole world would be aghast and would act uh, uh, immediately. This is the fairness that we're calling for. So as South Africa, we're not against anyone. We are for the Palestinian people, and I think this is very important. And uh, with the Arab uh, uh, nations, um, I you know, was hoping uh, that they'll come to believe that the Abraham Accords, so-called, are dead in the water, uh, but certainly that they'll continue to affirm, as we do, a two-state solution. Um, I think uh, they are really making uh, as much effort as possible to engage uh, in negotiations, uh, uh, in the cessation call uh, uh, with Israel. Um, I understand that, you know, when there's proximity uh, to an issue in diplomacy, you may act rather differently than, you know, a country like South Africa might act. So uh, rather than, you know, trying to be you know, revolutionary or radical or sound, you know, popular. I understand that uh, struggles occur on many fronts. Mm -hmm. But what I really would want to see is really a statement that says uh, we, we're going to seize any notion of diplomatic relations until there's a step forward. Are you disappointed that there hasn't been any economic or diplomatic action taken by any Arab governments, that it fell to South Africa to try to hold Israel accountable for genocide. Maybe if you're further away, it's easier for you. I really don't but want to criticize Arab governments. Are you disappointed, uh, are you disappointed you know, though? Uh, Arab, uh, governments. I think that's not my place, really. Um, I would hope uh, for stronger statements. I would hope for reaction. Uh, I mean, I think this killing uh, uh, of uh, Palestinians trying to get aid, uh, that should really say this is disgraceful. You know, we must really take a harder step. Is the tide beginning to turn? Do you believe South Africa went to the ICJ despite the economic and political risks that it entailed? Do you believe that public opinion has shifted and that governments will have to follow suit? I think public opinion began to shift immediately uh, when Israel fired upon innocent uh, Palestinians. The protests that you saw worldwide indicated uh, that the world is absolutely disgraced, uh, both with the kidnapping of Israeli citizens by Hamas and the killing of innocent uh, citizens. Because we are fair. We, are, we don't admire one part and hate another. We're saying all harm to innocent civilians is wrong. But we recognize the greater challenge, and it is the freedom and justice for Palestinian people. That is the core issue. You're dealing with the people who have been occupied for decades and they need to have their own state and to enjoy human rights and freedom as all of us do. What do these events in, in Gaza, the double standards, the hypocrisy that you're alluding to, what do they tell us about the so-called rules-based order and the fact that some countries, in this instance Israel, seem to be immune and that international law is only selectively applied? Well, you know, uh, rules base has been coined by some, you know, almost to suggest uh, that when you're dealing with international affairs, it's like a soccer match, uh, that there's some referee somewhere who watches that rules are observed. The rules are international law. The rules are international humanitarian law. All the protocols associated with humanitarian law those are the rules that we all should act by. There are no other rules. So this notion of international rules, where, where are they written? It is the instruments, the conventions. These are the rules. The Security Council should be providing peace and security, should be ensuring the innocent are protected, should ensure that the resolutions year after year after year on Palestine are acted upon. 
there's not been. Do you expect this to be a tipping point, a turning point, a watershed moment, or is that wishful thinking? How do you overturn the institutional biases that have led us here? I think it should be a, a turning point because if we don't seize this moment, I think we're going to have a worse situation. Firstly, the real danger is more harm to Palestinian people. The second is much more of the world will come to believe inter international instruments don't matter and so I can abuse as I wish and that is deadly for people who don't have arms and who don't have protection and we cannot afford that uh, uh, in the world today. The third arm will be to the United Nations body, our premier global institution. If we don't protect its ability to be our global multilateral institution, we're going to see the mushrooming of a whole host of institutions and further uh, division uh, in the world. So at this moment, what we need is leadership. We need leaders who understand the moment, who understand that the geopolitical divide is a danger to the entire global community. And they have to stand up and confront the most difficult problems in a realistic fashion. Do we have these leaders? South Africa showed we're, we're leadership. Looking, we're looking for them. Well, we hope uh, that they'll emerge. Uh, there are many leaders uh, in the world. A lot of them are talking uh, the right language uh, with respect to a two-state solution. Uh, I'm very focused at the moment on Palestine, and I believe this is an issue we should address. But there are many issues on the African continent as well uh, that require attention. Uh, there are leaders, uh, and I think uh, they now need to stand up. On Palestine, you have shown leadership, South Africa has, so has Brazil and other countries as well. Do you expect to see serious repercussions as a result of the stance you took? Do you expect to see full-blown U.S. sanctions applied against South Africa, and what would you do? if that were the case? Well, I, I don't. I, I hope that that won't happen. Uh, I know there's a threat. Uh, there are uh, some resolutions uh, that have been tabled uh, by uh, members of the House of Representatives uh, against South Africa. I must say, uh, frankly, I'm astounded uh, because I thought nations have a sovereign uh, right to determine their own foreign policy. I've never understood international relations to mean what Turkey says is what South Africa must say, or what the United States says is what I must say. I, I believe that's very patronizing, uh, and I hope that uh, those intentions won't reach any uh, uh, level of implementation. I, I don't believe the American people are, are like that, but we'll continue to lobby, uh, to, to talk to them. Uh, we believe to act in that way against South Africa would be really beyond the pale. But how are you preparing for the prospect of U.S. sanctions? How economically devastating would it be for South Africa? It would be very, very bad for South Africa. Uh, but we must continue to build our economy. Uh, we must continue to expand trade uh, with the African continent. So I believe that it's very important um, that nations are not made to be afraid of being independent, because then we'll have a really terrible world. And trade shouldn't be used as a form of blackmail uh, to tell you how you should conduct yourself. What we should learn to do is to speak to each other in the appropriate fora or in our bilateral uh, uh, engagements in order to understand the perspectives uh, each of us hold. As freedom-loving people who had to wage a struggle against the evil of apartheid and racism, we can't stand idly by when others experience apartheid forms of discrimination or the kind of subjugation that the Palestinian people have been forced into. In your pursuit of justice, not just for Palestinians, you've also criticized other uh, international legal instruments, the ICC, for their uneven-handed approach following their arrest warrant for the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. You've also said in late 2023 that you expected the ICC to issue an arrest warrant for the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Do you still believe that that could happen? Well, I certainly hope so, uh, because uh, the crimes that have been uh, committed are indeed, uh, in our view, war crimes against uh, humanity. 
We also have uh, said the uh, ICC should investigate war crimes against Hamas as well. So we've been even-handed uh, in our referral to the ICC. When we met the leadership of the ICC recently to check where our referral is in terms of process and to express our concern that the ICC uh, seemed to act very speedily when it came to issuing a warrant for uh, President Putin concerning the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, but that we were not seeing this fast pace uh, in this terrible plight of the Palestinian people. Uh, they informed us that they are investigating. I said, but how long is it going to take? Because it was very quick uh, on the one side, and it's not as speedy on the other, and we'd like to see action. So we are still waiting up to today. Do you believe that the ICC has been a tool in Western hands? Because for the most part, they have also pursued cases that have only uh, targeted African leaders. Do you believe that to be we, a case? We had uh, come to have the view that uh, it was focused primarily as an anti-African uh, leaders uh, institute, institution. Uh, but after much discussion, we felt it's important to have uh, such a body. Hence, uh, we decided to remain uh, within it. But we do still remain concerned. Um, and often it's issues of funding. Uh, it would seem uh, that whoever provides uh, uh, the greatest resources, and of course the weakness is that the more uh, significant countries of the world have not signed on to the Rome Statute. The United States being one of them. Being one, indeed. South Africa has long complained about the fact that the Global South, which represents about 85% of the world's population, is on the margin of global decision making, uh, that political and financial institutions are in the hands of a few Western nations. BRICS countries, in fact, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa make up 40% of the world's population. They account for a quarter of the global economy. Can they, do you believe, reshape global governance so that the world's majority has an equal voice uh, in decisions that affect their futures? I, I think it's their responsibility to try hard to do so because we can't leave things as they are. Um, India is a significant part of the world, both in economic terms and in terms of population size, but they're not on the Security Council. Uh, they're not a leader in institutions of global governance. So that must change. Africa uh, was still colonized when the United Nations was established. And since we achieved independence, we don't have an African representation permanently on the Security Council. Um, other matters of reform include the ability to enforce peace. Had we had a peace enforcement capacity in the United Nations, we would not have 30,000 plus Palestinians uh, dead, nor 30,000 plus Ukrainians uh, dead. So clearly, there is a need uh, for reform of global governance uh, in the world. But secondly, the most unfair practices are felt in the international financial system, where uh, many of us are bound uh, to the dollar. And we've often posed the question, why can't we trade in multiple uh, currencies? Let's look at developing systems that allow us to do so. So last year as BRICS, we've taken up the cudgels and we've established a task force made up of central bank governors and ministers of finance of the BRICS countries. And we're investigating this matter of trading internationally in our own currencies or multiple uh, currency trade. So let's see what the result of that will be. It's a big step, uh, but it does begin um, to challenge the received wisdom that you know, certain uh, countries must drive everything. Naledi Pandor, Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of the Republic of South Africa, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. As South Africa refuses to stand by, other emerging nations are also mounting their own challenges to a global order that is based on outdated and undemocratic power structures. 
Leaders in the global south are shaking up the status quo, using international law to address injustices around the world. The pursuit of justice for Palestine symbolizes the struggle against neocolonialism, as a growing number of governments refuse to play by the rules imposed by a handful of nations. For me, Rida Fakhri and the team, thanks for watching.